it's Liam auditioned as well. It came down yeah. between, I think, yeah, Chris and Liam. Yeah. And I, I used to do a joke on stage about that. Obviously, they're both uh, gorgeous. Yeah. That it's studs. like, do you know um, how much uh, of the grenade Liam has to be in that? In that, they're like, I mean, <laughs> it's like that Chris gets the thing. Bro, what about the third oh, brother man. who wasn't even? We wasn't we know even, him too. Oh, yeah. He's just he doesn't have their height, but he's got their bone structure. Yeah, bro. We did a table read with <laughs> him, hilarious. and I was like, bro, he looks like a tiny Russian doll that's in one of them. Like yes. you open up Chris Liam's under there, you open up him. There's a third one. He's like. <laughs> Dude, yeah, just oh dude. God, the insane, Hemsworth dude. for the holidays. It's yeah. on Hallmark this uh, Christmas. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Kite Club. First rule of Kite Club is like and subscribe, yeah? Second rule of Kite Club is like and subscribe. The rule, tell your friends. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Kite Club. With me, as always, is Ryan Neeson, my producer, Paul Corey. I'm Jonathan Kite. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you for all of your comments and um, your answer. And then we're gonna get to some of your questions later. Uh, we got a big one today. We got our first guest on. I'm really excited about this guy, Brock O'Hearn. You know him, you love him. He's all over the place. He's on uh, uh, the new um, uh, History of the World with Mel Brooks. My goodness, he plays, uh, he plays Hulk Hogan on Young Rock. Big star. We're so happy. We're going to be talking to him a little bit later in the pod. But uh, right now, this is our Oscars episode. That's why I'm dressed like the bathroom attendant at Epstein's Island. Um, I, uh, whew, I did not. Uh, I've had a long night. I'll just say that. Did you, did you get to go last night? I did not. I was not invited. I got a letter in the mail that said, please do not come. Oh. <laughs> right. uh, and so you went to like a party or something then? I did not go to a single party, no. I was uh, up all night at my own house watching the festivities and getting shit-faced alone and just excited for all the nominees and, and winners. And uh, I, I could use a coffee. I could use a coffee. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, um, it was cool, though. I am... I, um, uh, I love the I love that they were back. I love to go see movies in the theaters. This was a great year for that. Um, you know, I mean, there was a lot of. I love the movie Everywhere All at One, Every, Everything Everywhere All at Once. I thought it was fantastic. I did too. I thought to take the multiverse, the if you haven't seen the movie, the nugget, the way the the seed was, um, what if my mom was in the Matrix? Yeah, and that's how they created the movie. And I thought it was super cool. And um, you know, shout out to them for like for pretty much like sweeping the Oscars. It went seven for 11. I mean, that's pretty damn. And, and a couple times they were competing with themselves in the category, like best supporting. Um, I mean, that is damn impressive. That just doesn't happen anymore. No. Um, at that magnitude. And um, first time that an Asian woman has ever won best lead actress. I think first time an Asian guy has won best supporting. I mean, a lot of, and shout out, uh, you know, what's funny is I, I maybe have said this on the, the pod before, but um, K. Kei Hui Kwan was Jonathan Kwan for a long time. So he won the, uh, uh, the supporting. When I would put in my own name, because our names were spelled similar or they would misspell his name, Jonathan K, he would always come up first. So um, shout out to, I think I might change my name because he's not using Jonathan Kwan anymore. Yes, yeah, so you're, you're going to go by Jonathan Kwan? I'm going to go by Jonathan Kwan. You heard it here first. Or K, or, or K Hoon. Yeah, Kwan Club. <laughs> yeah, or yeah, K yeah. Hoon Kite. We're huge in China. I like K Hoon Kite. Oh, K K Hyun K Hyun Kite. Is yeah, we're having trouble over here saying it, uh, <laughs> but we'll work it out. We'll have PR figured out. Um, man, what a cool thing! Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, where she plays short round in. It's my favorite Indiana Jones movie. There's a lot of hate on that one. They only came out with the Last Crusade because that one was so brutal and so bloody that they were just like, we have to make this more fun-loving. I mean, think about the way that first one was, where he was just like, I hate snakes. And he was sort of, we got to fight the Nazis, but like in a fun way, you know, don't look at the Ark. And, uh. and then that second one, a man is ripping hearts out of chests. Yeah. And, and they're drinking blood, and there's slave labor. That was just, you know that that was just an iPhone factory. <laughs> Most people don't know that about the Temple of Doom was based on, that's what they call the iPhone factories in China. Um, but it was it was awesome, and dude, when they in the beginning when they're going when 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 they're dressed like this, and then they're going like you give me the diamond, and then they were poisoning him, and he's like, all right, Lao. It, it had so much depth and like adventure to it when they jump out of the plane. I mean, I thought it was the coolest thing, but it got 
so much, not flack, but the reviews were like, this is a little too aggressive. They come back with uh, Last Crusade, where it's like, you know, well, Sean Connery and him are just having a gay old time here, where, you know, they're both falling in love with the same girl. It's like a, it, they were like, it's like brand new writers, brand new team. I mean, probably still Steven Spielberg, but they're like, we gotta change. It can't just be like dudes ripping organs out of other people. I liked it. I like that one. I do too. That's what I'm saying. Temple yeah, of Doom for me was the best. And and uh, um, uh, I keep wanting to say Jonathan, but um, Kei Hui played short round in the movie. Okie dokie, Dr. Joe's horn here, potatoes. And he was the driver and also Goonies. Um, and, uh, you know, to, you know where he started, he was in a refugee camp. He came over here as a refugee for a year and now he has an Academy Award. I mean, that's... What an incredible journey. I mean, it's unbelievable to me. And the fact that him and Brendan Fraser won the same night. They were both in Encino Man. One of my favorite movies of all time. Rabobile, Rabobile. It's Pauly Shores at home right now just crying. No, he was there outside. The, selling they, they hot dogs? They wouldn't let him in. Oh. Yeah, no, selling hot dogs. They wouldn't yeah. let him in. He was just dressed as Oscar. He's like, I'm all in gold, buddy. He I'm won an Oscar Mayer. Inside. Yeah, <laughs> he's going to say he's giving away Oscar Mayer wieners. Yeah. Just awards on buns. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Yeah, it's called the hey, Weasel, <laughs> the Weasel dog, buddy. Um, but that's, I mean, we were talking about this a little bit off. I mean, Brendan Fraser, I love that guy. I was so happy that he won last night. He was having a bit of a panic attack on stage. Yeah, it looked like he was about to maybe pass out. Yeah, I mean, he, but he was having a whale of a good time. No one said that joke, and rightfully so, they shouldn't. We'll edit it out. Um, but the idea that, that, he, you know, because he got groped, if you guys don't know the story, at the Golden Globes several years back. And, it, it, you know, it, you know, he just removed himself from Hollywood. And to come back in this sort of fanfare, he didn't attend the Golden Globes. He said, he goes, I'm not a hypocrite. He doesn't support that. But for him to sort of be very public about it, because you don't hear it from a male's perspective all this time. And someone who I think has got to be one of the most beloved actors in Hollywood you know, The Mummy, he did so many incredible movies, Bedazzled, uh, he did, uh, how many mummies were there? I think there was three. There was three, The Scorpion yeah. King. The Scorpion King, Was yeah. the third one, Where wasn't one of them the something dragon? They were trying to bring, wasn't Jet Li in one of them? Well, there was Mummy 2 Electric Boogaloo, where he had to beat Enotep in that pop and lock contest. <laughs> the pop and lock. Yeah, yeah, with Emotep. Dude, yeah. I, the mummy movies are so entertaining it's unbelievable yeah the last one was the tomb of the dragon emperor the, the tomb of the dragon emperor was Jet Li in that one I think he was he was yeah yeah by the way who's like, when he got groped he was this was years ago right like 15 20 years ago I, yes he's a giant guy that's a bold move yeah I mean I think it's 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 a power move you know what I mean it's like when you see like a little dog like humping a big dog that's a power move from that little dog there's no way that a guy groped him bigger than him yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Why? Like, I just it was don't. a chihuahua and a tuxedo. The, the same who was thing just happened. like, hey. The same thing happened to Terry Crews. <laughs> what Terry, happened? Terry Crews was groped also. By the same guy? Oh, not the same guy. This oh, guy's a serial groper. Breaking news? Wait, uh, who was it? Uh, let me look up right now. Yeah, he, was, uh, he has a lawsuit. Whoa. Yeah, this guy was groped at a Hollywood party. He groped his privates. It's like, who's doing that to Terry Crews? Yeah, stupid people. Maybe it was hopefully the guy was blind and he was just like, oh, sorry. It was an Cruz. agent. It was an I thought agent. you were Tom, but it feels like you're Terry. It was an agent um, at uh, WME. Whoa. Yeah. And, Adam Vennett, your agent. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, <laughs> uh, hold on. <laughs> Did you get 15% of that growth? <laughs> no, I, I don't think you know how that works. I don't get, I don't get money <laughs> off of their, hey man, I heard you had a good <laughs> weekend. <Yeah. laughs> uh, I'm going to expect, it's funny, I haven't gotten the check yet. And yeah. by the way, who's paying for groping? <laughs> Not Terry Full Cruz. Disclosure, I don't know how, how, how agents work. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. going to say. So Ryan doesn't have an agent. Yeah, they pay uh, you 15%. Not represented in Hollywood. Uh, the only Jew not represented in Hollywood. Surprising. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's, yeah, that's a, that's a bold move. But for a guy like that to kind of have this resurgence, um, it's just, a, it's a very cool end of the story. Because um, I, I just love Brendan Fraser. I, I really think that that guy... Was he is a movie star in a way that was was undeniable. He did School Tides. He did so many amazing projects, and to have it, it's and to have them win. Here's the craziest thing. So Harrison Ford, you guys remember, presented the the best picture to everything everywhere all at once. Which which uh, uh, I'm going to keep want to say Jonathan and I apologize. The Kehui was in, and they were in Indiana Jones together. 
Yeah. That moment when they're hugging, I don't think there was a dry eye in Hollywood. And then did you see how uh, happy Steven Spielberg was? Too? I, well, no, that's and, what I was gonna say. Yeah. And and his wife Kate. Um, uh, I, I, I apologize. Kate Capshaw, excuse me, Kate Kate Capshaw. She played the the, the love interest in the movie, so they were all mm. there that night for that guy to win. I mean, what an amazing story! And the fact that we, you know, because he has said this very publicly, Kate Hui said that he, you know, he worked in, in in pretty big movies. I mean, obviously, he was Data from the Goonies. I think one of the greatest it's a kid great of all time. You know, easily, easily. I mean, it's iconic. Um, it's like that is a that actually is a litmus test for me. When, a litmus test when I show someone that movie and they don't like it, I don't like them. Yeah, I would agree. I just think like it, like the spirit and the adventure of those kids. Um, I just think I don't know. I just I think that movie's incredible. And he plays Short Round in it, who's like the inventor. Um, and then he said the roles just dried up for for his type. And and we were singing this off. It's like yeah, I think about if you were Asian for such a long time, he must not have known karate. Because you think about like the parts that were going to Asian American actors, they were mostly just martial art films. Yeah, that's true. But, I mean, very. If you think about the ones that have broken here, you know, it's like uh, uh, Jet Li, Jackie Chan. I mean, you know, even Michelle Yao, who doesn't know martial arts, they said. Has never I mean, how good is she in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, though? It broke yeah. all those stars. Chow Yun Fat. It's like, uh, um, it's anyway, so that was really cool that a guy like that could make it and didn't need to be able to do martial arts, that he was able to do, have his own journey, his own story. But he was like, he's like, it dried up. That's what happened. People, you don't realize that. Like, you think, I mean, you know, like, not that this is any like Hollywood insider information, but you think once you're on something, you're going to be set for life. And then, and I think that there's that weird perception, like, no matter what you do, but at some point, audiences, they only see you that way. Like, you think about how hard the kids from Harry Potter have to work. Or even, this is true, like, when I was Oleg on Two Broke Girls, right after the show, people, whenever my agents would call in and try to submit me on stuff, they would be like, oh, he's not Russian. Like, we, we can't, we're not looking for a Russian guy. And my agents had to be like, he's an American dude from Chicago. I have to send them a tape of me like like a like like a like a you know the first part of a beheading video to be like please I'm American <laughs> yeah proof of life photos what's up proof of life that's what I mean yeah, exactly yeah. yeah yeah like a proof of life video like please help please whatever and and then when people would meet me all the time they'd be like damn you're not Russian so you really have to prove yourself time and time again so you look at somebody who's been out there for as long as they have someone like Brendan Fraser or whatever Jamie Lee Curtis unbelievable example I mean the fact that you know she's been able to do it since Halloween one of my favorites. It's amazing. So anyway, just shout out to all those people. I mean, what a what a cool um, what a cool year. I'm, I, I you know Elvis. Did you see Elvis? I saw Elvis. Um, Austin Butler still sticking with that accent. It's, oh, thank it's, you. So, it's wild. Thank you so much. He thinks he's Elvis now. By the way, the fact that he's not when he he people are like you're great in the movie and he goes oh thank you thank you how is he not <laughs> saying <laughs> thank you thank you very much. He's doing the voice, but he's not doing any of the catchphrases. Yeah, Austin has left the building. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's not doing anything. He, he's brother. The fact that he's not always eating a peanut butter and banana sandwich is confusing. Here, to wait, me. you're Austin, real quick, and this is me. I'm interviewing you after you didn't win. Hey, what was it like not winning the uh, Academy Award? Oh, it actually it sucked. I uh, was only <laughs> keeping up the accent until the fucking award show. <laughs> that's what should have been. Yeah, and uh, and now, uh, yeah, now I'm gonna go on and I guess I'm gonna play Asian because that's what wins. <laughs> so I'm going on to play uh, Jackie Chan next year. You've heard it here, Austin in Butler the in the Jackie Chan biopic. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I mean, it's like uh, it's crazy because you you see him in all this stuff and and he even sort of you know he's got he's always like I feel like. His stylist is like, what would Elvis wear? That's what his band says. Yeah. What would Elvis wear? Because he's even sort of like dressing like him still. He's still got the hair going. Yeah. I mean, you know, that is a huge life commitment. He's transitioning to into Elvis. Elvis. <laughs> he's the first trans Elvis. Yeah. Um, he's going to be working in Vegas soon, just on the strip. Well, with that's all the what other I was going to say to you. Like, he's like a guy who's like learning to be an impersonator. By the way, he's unreal in the movie. Like, I, I always think that music biopics are the hardest to make because we look at rock stars and musicians and all this as, as gods. And it is hard to separate the man or the woman from the myth. And so I think that they've done it. Like, I still think Ray 
maybe to me the best that ever did it or um, Val Kilmer in the doors. Like I think those are probably the two best that ever really did it because there's such a totality to what they're doing. And the, obviously, I mean, I'm the biggest Jamie fan. It's like the fact that he could play. He, he was doing the impression so long when he was on Living Color, he used to do the character Ray Charles in Charge where he would do... I mean, talk about a journey to do a sketch character that you have made even better to win the Academy Award, and he won across every category. He won the BAFTA. He won every award for that. But it's like that's a really hard thing because the way and, and I'm the reason I'm getting to it is Colonel Tom Parker. It was my dream role, by the way. Like, and the fact that Tom Hanks is playing like a weird, like Austrian Bond villain. There is plenty of video of he looks more like Fat Bastard from Austin Powers. Mm -hmm. By the way, he looks like he's doing a community theater production of Brendan Fraser's The Whale. He's in so much latex, it's unbelievable. And he's sort of doing like a hello, how are you today? Hello, Mr. Elvis. There's video. Colonel Tom Parker was born in Austria, but he grew up in the States. So he has a southern twang. There's a lot of video of him available. So the idea that, that they're going for such accuracy, although it is, you know, it's, it's Baz Luhrmann, it's over the top, but to how accurate Austin Butler is with Elvis and the fact that you just sort of have this sort of like, hello, how are you over there? Like a cream puff with the Austrian accent saying, I'm going to make you the biggest star in the world. And it's like, you're like, you just look like a, he looks like a fucking beanbag chair. And everyone, I am the biggest Tom Hanks fan. I love Tom Hanks. But when I heard that voice, I'm going... Maybe he's so big on set that people are like, yeah, let him do what he's going to do. Is this the first time he's ever played a bad guy in a movie? I can't think of another movie where he's played like not the hero. Well, if, it depends on I, w if, uh, I was going for corporate America in Philadelphia. He was a bad okay. guy in that one. He was a bad guy. If you're the Catholic yeah, Church, uh, yeah, he yeah. was a bad guy. Exactly. Got it. Um, okay. So, you know, no, he's always a good guy. No, he's everyone's dad. Yeah. He's everyone's grandpa now. He's like, he, you know, he's, he's breastfeeding us all. Um yeah, I don't. I mean, I do think that the character is so polarizing and so interesting, you know. And and, and to get somebody, obviously, I know that you think Tom Hanks, he's going to sell the movie, right? Because he's so famous, he's got to play that part. But there, in terms of transformative actors, because I do think that Tom Hanks has that ability. But there are other guys out there that I think, if we were going to go with somebody who wasn't actually the weight or the age, I mean, somebody like Christian Bale, have been good. I mean. There's a, you know, if he was alive, I mean, obviously this is, we're now doing ridiculous hypotheticals. Philip Seymour Hoffman. That'd have been great. Would have been unreal. Oh, well, Colin, would have crushed. crushed. Colin Farrell played the penguin <laughs> in the last Batman movie. Like anybody. Like, no, no, a, well, yeah, anybody, but yeah. Uh, yeah, Tom Hanks is like, hi, I'm, I'm Colonel Tom Parker. <laughs> Come on, hi, oh, Elvis. <laughs> Elvis has left the building. <laughs> That's his screen test for it. Tom Hanks screen test, take one. Yeah. Oh, Elvis, I'm going to make you rich. You try, oh! can you try that again, Tom, make it less you? Uh, well, no. <laughs> yeah, wait, wait did you make it less me? Can you make it less you, please? Uh, hello, Mr. Elvis. Okay. I'm uh, going to make you the richest man in the world. Let me just tie up this damsel to the train track. <laughs> Isn't that a mustache? <laughs> It's the weirdest Dutch Stop. accent I've ever heard. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stop doing uh, space work with a mustache, Tom. It's not there. Yeah. He never had that mustache. Um, it's hard because you want to make him a villain, but I, I think I like the idea of, of, of Shakespearean heroes and villains where you let the audience make the decision. So it's like, because Colonel Tom, who I think is one of the most fascinating people in the world, he was a villain to summon a hero to others. And so I think to paint him as this villain right away, I don't, I don't know that you need that. I think that he's interesting enough. It's just like stick to the story. It, was he a war criminal? Like they kept alluding to that. I feel like in the movie, they made like weird things. I don't like... know. I, yeah, I, I'm not sure. But even then, you don't, I mean, yes, th that's part of his past if, if that's what they're going with. But also like what he was to the public without social media where he was the gatekeeper of Elvis, you know, right. essentially, he was as big of a myth and with all the stories that Elvis was. And so I think to have a guy like that just paint that picture and you don't need to make it like a caricature or something else. He already was. Have you ever heard that guy talk? He sort of, he has a, he has a, 
I'm gonna do the, this is a terrible impression, but he has like a high pitched voice, and he's from the south, and he's and he doesn't have a right southern accent because he's Dutch and he's trying to figure out yeah. the southern twang. And he moved here when he was 20. Yeah. So if he was a war criminal, he got that in early. Yeah, he was a Hitler youth then. Man, he's like, I got to get out of here. Yeah, that'd be interesting. I wish there was like so, some way to go. I, maybe we should do this. Just start accounts of on social media for dead celebrities that were huge in like the 40s and 50s and 60s. And just have it like that'd be interesting. I'd like to see how they run their social media account. Dr. Seuss. Like El- it's just a lot of the we racism. Know yeah, we know how that went. No, went. but Elvis on social media. Like, what, look at this peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Yeah, I mean, like it's, just it's, it's banana. Yeah. By yeah. the way, why is Austin still doing it? Does he think there's going to be a sequel? <laughs> they didn't show him dying, but yeah, he, he never did. It's just yeah. him on an island with Tupac and Biggie. Oh, yeah. That'd be funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I always want to do so. I've. Often, because uh, we got some comments, we were talking about this, we did a show together this weekend about people are commenting on what I look like. And I'm always, you know, uh, interested because I, I wanted to do biopics. There's a picture, we'll throw it up, of Billy Joel that I look just like a young Billy Joel or Anthony Bourdain. I'm telling you, I don't know who needs to make this happen, but I am. Um, hello out there on the internet. I'm Anthony Bourdain. And I think that Jonathan Kite would be an excellent choice to play me in a biopic. He's got that smooth charisma, those heroin thin arms, and a cock the size of a 14 inch hoagie. Welcome <laughs> to Parts Unknown. Let's make this fucking happen. Um, there's an old picture where I look a lot like Anthony Bourdain when he went, uh, when he back in his chef days. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. He had some fun hair. Yeah, crazy. He looked like Sideshow Bob. He's yeah. like, give me the Sideshow Bob. <laughs> Um, people were saying online, well, who were they saying? Christopher Mintz Platt. Yes. McLovin. McLovin. Yeah. Which by the way, but then, but truth be told, we pulled up a modern picture of him. That's like that. That's like just white guys who look like we don't really look alike. All you guys look alike. Yeah, exactly. All, all you people, all, uh, all you people from super bad. Yeah. Um, or people, somebody had said Kevin Sussman who played Stewart on the big bang theory. Um, I was like, yeah, I, again, it's like white guys with big eyes, I guess. Um, but I think, I mean, listen, I'd love to play Chris Mintz Platts in the Chris Mintz Platts bio. You play him older? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's the future. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I don't know. It was great. Anyway, congrats to all the winners. This was, it was a, it was a fun time. We want to talk about the Mexican cartel a little bit? Yeah, we can talk about The Mexican cartel, for those of you who don't know, um, apologized uh, after four... Americans went down uh, so one of them could have a procedure, a medical procedure um, in Mexico. And two of them were, uh, four of them were kidnapped and two of them wound up getting killed by a Mexican cartel. And uh, how many subjects or subject, how many subjects, how many? uh, uh, Five suspects. Suspects, yeah. The cartel just gave them up. They gave them up and with an apology note. Handwritten. (laughs) It was a handwritten note. Yeah. Nice touch. But I, do you think it's a little bit like a little fuck you? I think it's um, basically just so our army doesn't come down. Exactly. Just yeah. Fuck shit up. I think it's like our bad. Here are the five guys. God bless. Good luck yeah. with everything. By the way, four people going down there for surgery in Mexico. There was a good chance two of them died anyway. Who's to say that they, <laughs> that they didn't put those are five surgeons? Yeah. This is just a new episode of Botch. There's so much shark <laughs> uh, um, stem cells in them. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's like, I mean, I, I don't even know. Did they just get kidnapped? Because they thought that they were somebody else. They thought they were like, smuggling drugs. Like they thought they were drug smugglers coming, trying to bring stuff down. Who smuggles drugs into, into Mexico? Mexico? I was just going to say, what are you trying to make a return? Yeah. They give us fentanyl. We're bringing them. I don't, we're There's bringing an evening. Yeah. Cholesterol it's like, medicine. It's like they're doing the Indiana Jones arc the, for the balloon in their ass. Yeah. This seems lighter. And then I read something the other day too, that like there's like four women missing in Mexico still that went down there. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. The board of tourism. Three women. Three women. In Texas missing in Mexico. One came back. No, three, oh, women, you just got the number wrong. three of them are uh, missing for two weeks. Damn. Yeah, in Mexico. So they're probably dead too. I remember. So I, we both, we were there for your wedding last year. I love Mexico. And for surgeries. There was, yeah, yeah. We, we were two other people. Yeah. <laughs> they never came back. They, uh, it was weird because a couple of years ago when I was wanting to go to Mexico, I feel like every time I brought it up to somebody, they had a horror story about like somebody that they know that something had happened to or like the hotel that they were at got robbed or, uh, and I remember when I went down for, um, to, there's a, there's a, for my buddy's one year wedding anniversary a couple years ago, we went down there and 
I was like, what is stopping, um, you know, the, the cartels or whatever from just coming into this resort? They own them. No, and that's yeah. what they were saying. They're like, they own them or the payouts are through the roof. Yeah, it's like when the mob ran Vegas. Like, exactly. you're safe. Exactly. You're safe there. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so we, we, oh. we, only left, we only left the premises when we had guides. When we had like their assistance, I for you, my, my buddy before my buddy Chris for his for his bachelor party, we went and did a cruise to Ensenada, and I mean we've done dumb things. Looking back on hindsight, what we did in Mexico was so stupid. We got out, went to one of the bars. Fine, this bar was run by all gang members that were kicked out of the. You US. were on a drug tour. We were on a drug tour. We were the only ones in this bar, so they were treating us like we're the kings. I get hammered, and I ask one guy, I'm like, "Hey, man, cute. this guy's got tattoos of like thirteen on his eyebrows." And Why? Shit. What'd you ask? I asked, uh, could you take me to the ATM machine? So this guy takes me to the ATM machine. I take out $200 in pesos because I want to make it rain pesos. And uh, as soon as I got my money out, I was like, this was really dumb. And I just like, for him taking me to the ATM, which was like 12 feet away, I just gave him like 20 bucks. I'm like, hey man, thank you for uh, taking this. I just gave him 20 so he wouldn't rob me for the whole thing. Guys, this is a new segment we have called, how is Ryan still alive? (laughs) (laughs) Um, It was so dumb. It was so dumb. That is insane. Hey, can you take me down this alley to where I can get cash out? With yeah, my yeah. So I was hanging out in this opium den. Yeah. Um, Jesus Christ. So Mexico's safe is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. If you're at the right place, it's safe. Um, that's, we feel that. And we say this from the comfort of our Southern California. This podcast is being yeah. taken place in Mexico right now. Um, now time for mailbag. Thank you so much for sending in your questions. Keep sending those in. We're going to uh, get to as many as we can every week. I'm going to answer a couple of them now. Um, so I posted a video um, yesterday or a few days ago now when this comes out about almost meeting Seth Rogen and someone asked me, have you ever met other celebrities that you do impressions of? So there's one time that I did a table read that um, a friend had invited me who was the other lead in the movie and it was at Wild West Studios with Vince Vaughn. And Vince Vaughn knew that somebody at that table read did an impression of him, but he didn't know who it was. And so at the end of the table read, everything's going well, and Vince, Gaunt, Vince Vaughn goes out of the room, like to the bathroom or whatever, and his producing partners all turn to me, and they're like, do Vaughn, do Vaughn. And it was like they had said, like, Beetlejuice three times, because Vince Vaughn just, like, appeared. <laughs> and he was just like, uh, ah, yeah, yeah, do me, man. How do I sound? Like how, like, how would I sound or whatever? So I sort of look at him, I look at the room, and I'm going like, okay. And then um, my friend was like, yeah, yeah, just go do it for him. And then I... I'm like, hey, baby, my man, I like the energy that you bring to the table. We're both from Illinois. <laughs> and I just go off. And his face went as white as a ghost. And the cool thing was, and I had to tell him right away, I was like, hey, just so you know, like I do other impressions. Like I didn't want him to think I was vocally stalking him or whatever. Hmm. And I did like Tom Hanks, Tom Cruise, all the Toms, Tom from Tom and Jerry. And um, it was like, you know, but that was such a surreal moment because he was on the spot. And I really, he, first and foremost, he was a great sport about it. Because that's a weird thing to get like, like this is what you sound like to a lot of, because everyone was laughing, but it was clearly coming from a place, or at least I thought it was, uh, of, um, you know, uh, admiration. Like I'm a huge Vince Vaughn fan, but you really never know how people are going to take it when you do an impression of right. their face. Yeah. I mean, it's not, if you're, I mean, yours isn't like a character of him either. Like you're doing him in a movie, obviously, where he's talking super fast. Yeah. And that's what I but, tried to do. Yeah. I wasn't like, yeah, I wasn't um, having him like, you know, uh, you know, give out banking information or whatever. Like it wasn't, he was just very chill, you know, and he was chill about it, but it was one of those very, very weird moments where I was like, oh shit, I felt like on the spot and I, and I wanted to do right by him and not think that I was like being a dick about it. He seems like a cool guy. Very cool guy. Very cool guy. Um, the first impression somebody asked that I ever learned. So the first impression I ever learned was there was, um, from the movie Casablanca, but I'm dressed like bogey tonight. Um, Peter Lorre, very famous actor. He was a Hungarian actor, one of my favorites. He was in um, M, very famously. And he, um, I sort of look like him a little bit. Like I have sort of big sleepy eyes. So when I was a little child, I learned this sort of guy who always was guilty. Oh no, my name is Peter Lorre and I, I was in the Maltese Falcon. I was in the Arsenic and Old Lace. He always had like this guilty sort of thing where he was sweating it out that someone was going to find out about him. So that was the first impression I ever did. Second one was Bill Cosby, and I just put a chloroform on a rag. And no, no, I um. <laughs> it was mostly when you were bartending. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I would, I would just, I was little, I was like a little kid, just running around going like, "No, here's the deal, the thing about the Jello pudding," bah! like a four year old little kid <laughs> running around. Like that was, that was so when I would go to my mother's work, 
I would bring these little donut holes from Dunkin' Donuts. And um, to keep me busy, she would give me a box of 50 of them and just have me go around the entire office. And I would just be Bill Cosby giving donut holes to, to people at like four years old. You were giving them. He was filling them. <laughs> Whoa. I was a kid. Um, but yeah, it was, it was fun. It was like, it was a great, um, it's my fondest memory of Bill Cosby. Was my impression of your impression of him. <laughs> we have our first guest on the podcast. This is incredibly exciting for us. You know him from everywhere. You know him from Real Bros of Simi Valley. You know him from uh, as playing Hulk Hogan on Young Rock. Huge success on NBC. Check it out. Um, you know him from History of the World Part 2, which is on Hulu. It's streaming right now. Mel Brooks, the classic. And my, my, my wife's fantasies. Oh, shit. <laughs> Give it up for Brock O'Hearn. Come on, Brock yeah. O'Hearn in the building. Dude, this dude. is so exciting for us. Thank you so much for being our first guest on the show. Oh, are you kidding me, dude? A pleasure, man. Thank you guys for having me on. Dude, when, when you walked in, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I patted your arm and I was like, <laughs> yeah, as, uh, as advertised. Yeah. You're yeah. the opposite of that meme, what you ordered, what you got. You look like you're on a steady diet of uh, super serum. And the blood of your enemies. Listen, uh, you go to the right parts of Hollywood, they give it out. Bro, you know? I've only been to the wrong parts of Hollywood. Oh, well, there you go. That's, I, I have, dude, this actually has shoulder pads. They're like, Brock's going to be on the show. I'm like, I was like, guys, can we fit me with a Dorothy from Golden Girls? Everybody, look how big I look. Guys, look how, we're both huge. You're like the dad from The Incredibles. Single tier. <laughs> You got to do that one day. Get one of those uh, muscle padded suits that yeah. they're giving all these superheroes these days. Oh, how do you? Great, it's, dude. it's amazing about that. So first thing we, we were talking about before you got here. Yeah. And maybe because you were too young. I don't know. But how did you audition for Thor? I was too young. Yeah. And I don't even think I'd started acting yet. Um, it was it was something that, you know, I, I heard about it. I heard about it from friends. Uh, and since then, I've heard about probably every single guy that went out for it. Um, but yeah, I was a couple years too young, I think, and uh, didn't get the chance. But that would have been a that would have been a fun one. NBC, we're pitching you, Young Thor. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's on after Young Rock. <laughs> oh, um, man. And uh, dude, I mean, I, well, that yeah, because um, it's Liam auditioned as well. It came down yeah. between, I think, yeah, Chris and Liam. Yeah. And I I used to do a joke on stage about that. Obviously, they're both uh, gorgeous. Yeah. That it's studs. like, do you know um, how much uh, of the grenade Liam has to be in that in that. They're like, I mean, it's like that Chris gets the thing. Bro, what about the third oh, brother? Man. It wasn't even. We, wasn't we know him too. Oh, yeah. He's just, he doesn't have their height, but he's got their bone structure. Yeah. Bro, we did a table read with <laughs> him hilarious. and I was like, bro, he looks like a tiny Russian doll that's in one of them. Like yes. you open up Chris Liam's under there. You open up him. There's a third way. He's like, oh. <laughs> Dude, yeah, just oh dude. They're, they're the Hemsworths dude. for the holidays. It's they're, on Hallmark this uh, Christmas. They're his avatars. Yeah, he hops in a thing and just controls them. He always Hilarious, plays his older brother. Yeah. He's like, just be you. He goes, I don't want to be Chris. It's actually just him, and he puts on the bodysuit and he yeah, controls each one dude, of them. Dude, hundred percent. He's, he's like two uh, kids in a trench coat trying to get into an R-rated movie. <laughs> he's like, no, I'm serious. I'm Chris. I'm Chris Hemsworth. Um, but too funny, man. Dude, that is. Uh, it's amazing. By the way, congratulations on all the well-deserved success. Um, Thanks, you, man. I mean, it's like Young Rock is a Adam Ray, one of my great yep. friends, dude. Yeah, I can love Adam Ray so much. We actually were doing stand up with him uh, this weekend. I've, I've known Adam fifteen years. Dude. We were at the same voiceover agent amazing. agency forever ago, before I was even into stand up. And um, what an amazing! Everybody loves wrestling. Oh yeah, yeah. And then to go back to the history of almost the beginning of it, you know, or, or some of the. Best moments, man, and uh, Ray playing Vince, dude, is he's so good, man. He's one of the first people I met on set, and uh, his scene was right before mine walking out, and I heard him do a big speech. I'm like, dude, this guy's got it. Dude. Well, he's so positive, and he's such a salesman, but like without the BS. Like when you meet Adam, we were talking yeah. about when we were doing the shows this weekend because I do impressions and so does he, and we were talking about doing an impression of Adam. And he said that somebody in his family does an impression of him, but just as like, hey, Adam, the world's ending. And then Adam was like, all right, things are going to be good, you know? And it's just like he's, <laughs> so he's such a warm and, – and Vince McMahon would need to do that yeah. to run this global empire. So I was, you play Hulk Hogan. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, that's incredible. How did that go? Like, was there like an open call? Did they approach you? Uh, yeah, they actually, uh, Dude, it's kind of awesome. crazy, man. They were searching high and low for, for Hulk, man. And they, I got the call, um, cause I, I was filming something at the time and I couldn't do the audition for some reason, but I got the call that they're like, look, we want you to play Hulk. Uh, and they yeah. couldn't find someone. They said that they found people who could do it, but they didn't have the physicality. Right. 
So it had to be the combo of you had to be able to perform as Hulk and you also had to have the size. And so gave me a good excuse to pack on a little bit of muscle and have some fun on set. But I was super grateful to be a part of that. The, the crew, the cast, uh, the team over at NBC, everybody's just amazing, man. It was an honor, honestly. And it's so cool that you're playing somebody that who's beloved. Oh, yeah. Hulk Hogan, you get oh. to play a hero. I mean, when we were growing up, yeah. he was my favorite wrestler. The, that's what was so cool is the more I got to dive into, you know, Terry Boyla, Hulk Hogan. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. The more you learn about they, they couldn't get rid of him if they tried. You know, they couldn't make him a, a, a heel. They couldn't like it was just impossible because his fans support him so much. And he was the reason we had WWF, WWE, you know, like yeah. he, it, it sprung off his back. And that's what that story was about. That storyline in Young Rock was him essentially passing the torch on to The Rock is the coolest thing, man. Yeah, it's, and it's amazing that you, because when when so for for a lot of Hollywood, um, for people who don't know, when they when you play an iconic character like this or you play somebody that's real, they really need they need the dimensions to be right. Yeah. Because especially in a sport, it's always the funniest thing when somebody who like doesn't clearly play the sport is having to do it on the big screen. It, they get criticized immediately because yeah. there is a grace and and a and a, just a movement about a, a, a normalcy where you where you we're so used to these peak athletes doing something a certain way and then to get somebody who's like not as big or not as physical or not as athletic as someone like you it's such a red flag to the fans yeah and to get someone like you who's so true to it I mean you I mean hell you even look enough like him it's it's amazing well that's that's another thing that I gotta take my hat off to is casting man because I've had a beard for years and I obviously have or for me I've never had handlebars so I had no idea what was gonna come down to yeah I was in the makeup chair for the day of filming my first scene uh, or, or first episode, and I was in the makeup chair for eight and a half hours, man. And I'm Ooh. sitting there just getting pulled apart, hair, they, I have crazy long hair down to here. They had to figure out how to put it in a bald cap, do everything else, shave the handlebars, do the whole thing. By the time we you know, put the spray tan on and bleached the, the handlebars, I was like, whoever cast this is a genius because I believed I was him, you know, looking at it. They're like, oh, we don't even have to put a butt chin on you. I'm like, yeah, I go. I came, uh, I came with the package, man. But uh, really, <laughs> it was, it was a crazy. crazy we'll throw experience. up a photo of that. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. That's why the physicality is so important because yeah. they know that they can do so much with the face. But if you're not the shape of the guy, yeah, it's you, you know. And then and, what are you going to put on a Brendan Fraser and just wave no, it off? Yeah, you, you know could, what I mean? You it's, you're right. Yeah. The muscle suits we were talking about, yeah. all the superheroes and stuff like that. It's like. There are some guys that really do it, and then some guys that are shopping at Hot Topic. I'm one of those guys. Yeah. Do you, and, I was going to say, did they make you do, like, training? Did you actually do wrestling training? Um, a this? lot of the guys. So, Hulk, uh, my character was initially, the way they had written, was the finale we were actually going to wrestle. Uh, and it ended up switching to, it was all dialogue between me and him. So, I didn't personally get to do the training, but the majority of the guys on set all did it, and they had some incredible matches. and. Some extremely physical guys. I mean, they're learning this stuff and have to look like a pro within a day, within you know a yeah. week. Uh, so, so my hats off to those dudes as well. But um, yeah, man, I I fell in love with wrestling even more just from this this role. To be That's honest. so great. Yeah, yeah. And, and then you did Real Bros of Simi Valley. Yeah, man. That's so. That, I mean, that was like a that was really like an internet sensation went viral. Oh yeah, it's unbelievable. So Jimmy Tatro is yeah, a bun. Jimmy's the man. Super funny guy. Yeah. If you guys don't know him, check him out. Um, and uh, Ryan is actually a real bro of Simi Valley. From That's where Simi he's Valley. from. Oh, no way. There I'm you go. From Simi Valley. Inspired yeah. by you, Ryan. I guess so. I think I'm <laughs> going to go after some residuals. No, this is what it is. Right. This is what you ordered. This is what you got. Yeah, this. <laughs> I'm the wish version. Everyone's Just like, okay, home. what are Simi Valley guys like? You're the consult on set. You're like, well, I... we were really muscular. Yeah. We we're had the... gorgeous flowing locks of, of godlike hair, huge beards. Yeah. Giant flat brim hats and large trucks. That was, uh, that was Simi it, Valley, man. baby. Yeah, it's no, cool to be a part it. of something like that that really caught fire. Oh yeah, and then and to have it just sort of like snowball into this unbelievable success. But it's also like a testament to creators, man. It's like you don't have to just create or write a script and think you got to go pay, get it picked up by a network and do this. They went out and made it. They put it on the internet, like you said, it caught fire, and then it became bigger. You know, it became so much bigger in the fan base. There, it's. I think they could release a uh, season ten years from now. People would still tune in. You know. Oh yeah, like yeah. in a weird way. It's like what they're doing with, with Jersey Shore. How yeah. it's like sort of like it's a reboot of their own thing of where are they now to yeah, see yeah. you guys. I mean, and everybody in the group, yourself, Jimmy, everybody, you're getting more famous. So for you guys to come back and do like your sort of grassroots kind of thing together. Yeah. What an amazing thing. Um, and now currently uh, History of the World, part oh, two. Dude. dude. Just came out, yeah, March 6th uh, to 9th. They did uh, eight episodes. 
to a night and now it's fully available yeah, streaming yeah, was... on Hulu. Dude, what an honor. Again, another one that, you know, is going to sound funny. Like I don't audition for stuff. I audition all the time, but I got offered the role, uh, the day, essentially the day before. And it was because of my work on righteous gemstones that they saw, they, they're like, you'd be a perfect fit to play, you know, new age Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Um, and essentially they made this Rambo meets a Michael Bay film meets Jesus character. And <laughs> I was the one for the, for the fit. I, I, I'm going to fit the role, I guess. I mean, that's what an incredible thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, awesome, to work man. with Mel Brooks and oh, Nick dude. Kroll and Wanda. I didn't even know. It was so under wraps that they were doing it that I hadn't heard anything about it. And yeah, Nick Kroll is a genius. Ike Barinholtz, dude. As soon as I came on to set, Ike was the one grabbing me. He's like, oh, do you want some water, some snacks from Crafties or whatever? I'm like, bro, aren't you the EP and like you're Ike, man? Like, what are you, what are you doing here? And he was just the nicest dude. Everyone on set was awesome. But, you know, 41 years later to do a, a sequel to a Mel Brooks it's it's it still blows my mind right now and the way that they offer the role actually like i got it framed man they sent me this letter of you know we've got jack black and danny devito and these people all part of the cast and uh we love your work on righteous gym shows we're big fans of yours and then we would love to have you come on board and i was like you're putting my name with these guys and you're offering me this this opportunity of a lifetime to work with an icon man like it, it's it, I said this, and then I heard it when we were at the premiere, too. They said it was the easiest yeses they ever got from everybody oh, to make yeah. a show, ever. It's like when you do something yeah. like that, because most of the time, the people that we grew up with, they're gone, unfortunately, or yeah. they're not doing it. But like you, you know, I hear Mel Brooks do speaking engagements or whatever when he does interviews, and he's still Dude. so sharp. 96 years old sharper than anybody I know it, it's he made everyone in the crowd laugh he's hilarious he lives just like the way he shows up he just says what's on his mind and it's hilarious you know he's he's not holding back you know he's already uh, he's already done everything and you know it's <laughs> it's dude it's an honor I, that's all I can really sum it up to to be honest with you and that's cool that somebody like I, I mean that's the thing I feel like a good EP does that they want you to be as comfortable as you possibly can be around them because yeah. you're going to be thrown in to the water. It's a sink or swim kind of thing. Oh, yeah. You know, can somebody do it, especially comedy? And they've seen you obviously do it with Righteous Gemstones and, yeah. and Real Bros. It's like they research you and they go, this is the guy. Because yeah. obviously you don't look like a traditional comedian, like someone like, no, a, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, but but you really do need someone. Like you wouldn't want, um, you'd want somebody who you who looks like Jesus from the comic books. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and the fact that they got that in you, I mean, it's like a perfect marriage. So congratulations. What an amazing thing. Thanks, man. Yeah. Apparently growing my hair out was a good idea, I guess. <laughs> At least for a couple of these roles, man. You know, what's funny is I was remembering, I was saying this before you got here, that the way I um, had first seen a photo of you, a friend of mine was who he looks like you, but little. Yeah. And so he's like five, nine. And he was going to, for a modeling agency one time. And they were like, we already have a guy that looks like you to my friend. But then they show them you, and it's like Bruce Banner and then the Hulk. <laughs> and then so they're like, oh, we got, we got. And I remember my buddy being like, like he's showing me a photo. And I was like, yeah, you guys do look very similar. He goes, no, dude, this guy's like, I'm like, was he seven, eight? And like, and my friend's like five, nine. Oh, man. See, you know what's funny about that is I've had the exact same thing happen to me. I'll have buddies or I'll have friends send me auditions and they'll say they want him to look like this guy or whatever. And yeah. it's me. Yeah. Or they'll be on set for Vikings and they be like, we want him to look like this. And it was me in the, the hair and makeup or, you know, in casting or whatever. I'm like, where the hell was the call when it went for me? Yeah. You wanted that guy. I am that guy. Man. When we did Two Broke Girls, they they originally uh, so Cat Dennings was the first piece that they put in for the for the yeah. main uh, lead, and the breakdown said we'd like a Cat Dennings type, and then Cat was like, "All right, I'm a Cat Dennings type." But so many times it doesn't go. Like Carol Burnett famously has stories about that, where it's like, or Jack Black, they like yeah. the idea of someone or something. And then the reality, for whatever reason, I believe that when um, uh, uh, Carol Burnett had to audition on Broadway for a part that was for her. Wow. And it's like, you just, you never know. Yeah. I feel like a lot of times, too, you know, even casting to a degree uh, doesn't always know what they're looking for. And that's the audition process. You know, a lot of them of are so specific and they know exactly what they're looking for, without a doubt. But every now and again, it's it's our job to show them, right? It's our job to show up and maybe change their mind. You know, I've got so many so. friends and I've heard so many stories from actors on all levels that are like, I decided to go so far left field with this and that's what they chose, you know? And it kind of changed the character. And then they end up through a lot of seasons of shows too. You see them mold it to the people. 
Well, they want to do that. They they want. I would say when people are auditioning for something like Hamlet, and yeah. everyone there's a lot of anxiety for it. People want you to come in and be Hamlet. So yeah. it takes such a burden off of their shoulders to having to decide the character. Oh like, yeah. When I did Oleg, they wanted a fifty year old guy, and at the time I was thirty years old. And so yeah, if you can switch it on and make them see it that way. Because that's a reality. You're competing with a hypothetical in their head, but yeah. if they can see it in person, that's going to be way stronger in your favor. Without a doubt. Without Did you, doubt. you play sports growing up? Uh, I didn't get the chance, man. Yeah, I moved around a ton growing up. Uh, in high schools, I switched nine times. Uh, middle school, like, f I don't remember, four or five, maybe six. No, it was, it was about four. And elementary, I have no idea, but it was all over the map. Uh, and so every time I'd join a team or I'd want to play, uh, I moved. You know, and then I couldn't, I joined the football team and on this one, I'd moved to another school and they're like, you don't know our plays too late in the season. It's too this, too that. And I'm like, guys, even I didn't know at the time, but I'm going to be a pretty big guy. It might be in your favor to have me on the team, you know? <laughs> now and, they all claim you, you go uh, back to all right? those like, you know who went here, huh? Yeah, man. <laughs> I speak they bring you up at every award yeah. ceremony. Uh, this hilarious. reminds me of the time when Brock O'Hearn asked me for advice. No, like, yeah. I've seen his Wikipedia. He was here for two hours. <laughs> it's, it's the hilarious. pride of 33 schools. Yeah. <laughs> they retire your jersey. Yeah. They're like, great, he didn't play dude. for golf, and golf doesn't have jerseys. Leave it up there. Yep. Yeah. That'd be, dude, hilarious. It, um, no, so I never, I never got to play, but what I did get is, you know, I, I could take movies with me anywhere. You know, I totally. could I watch TV anywhere. So since I was young, that was my escape. And then when I found working out, uh, I mentioned before we started that I, you know, I was 6'3", 135 pounds. And I fell in love with working out, man. And I just, I wasn't comfortable with my skin. I didn't like, you know, the way people made fun of me. And, and I just felt awkward, you know. As soon as I found that, I stuck with it. And I was already a very fast sprinter, uh, runner. Never really liked long distance, to be honest with you. But I had the speed, and then I had the work ethic, and then I got the size and the strength. And, you know, sports weren't for me in the sense that, Flash forward after high school, I got scouted for D1 football three different times. And the last guy that came in, his wife even begged me to come in. And I had never played football, so I, was, I didn't even understand or grasp it at the time, uh, what potential it had for me. And he goes, the last three guys he scouted all went pro. Like, he knows what he's doing. You'd be perfect, you know. And, and uh, I, I was like, man, I don't, I don't know, you know. And I ended up going to a community college in Orange County. And they wanted me to play on the team, so I didn't start my clock. And I took two classes. One was a career planning class. One was nutrition because I loved working out and I loved, you know, learning nutrition. So I remember watching the football team and I'm like, dude, these guys are terrible. I don't even play football and I'm more athletic than these guys faster. You know, I could hit harder. I could do all the, all the stuff. Um, and I just, I just it didn't motivate me to want to go play. And then the career planning class, they had the second weekend, they had three columns. It was, here's the job. This is how much time it's going to take. This is how much money you're going to make. So I was like, well, what's the best option? Let's check this out. Yeah. It was be a doctor. It's going to take eight years. You're going to make 150 grand a year. And I'm like, that's my best option. One, my, all of the respect to doctors, but that wasn't for me. I didn't, I didn't have a passion to do that. Um, eight years, that's a long time for somebody who's got no money, who can't even afford community college, two classes in community college. And then I'm going to make 150 grand. I was like, how much debt am I going to be in? taxes you know like uh, where how if i even make it that far you know so i literally walked out of the class after reading that uh dropped out and packed a bag and moved to la wow yeah that's i mean but you you there's something that brought you you know what i mean it's like yeah you there's so many people that start i mean i don't think people realize because there's not a lot of guidance for that yeah. of how long it's going to take in med school and you're going to be accruing debt the entire time yep you know because I, I went to college to do acting i knew it right away but it was one of those things where I, I needed structure. And yep. so I said, if I had come out here right out of high school, I'd, you know, I'd be dealing crack, but less successfully than I am now um, on Hollywood and Highland. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the crazy thing about what we do. It's, it's different paths for everybody. Like I didn't start yeah. stand up until I was 31, 32 years wow. old. And you know, you gotta, you gotta do it when it feels right. You can't force. That's why whenever I, did you guys, you guys have kids on the set, right? Yeah. 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 It's always a weird thing when, I work with when you work with children because most of the time I'm like this kid does not want to be here like the parents are just sort of put, like pimping them yeah. out there you, and it's got to be a weird thing and then every now and then you'll see a kid where you're like this is what they 
you know, he or she or they want. Yeah. And then you can, you go, this is the right direction. But a lot of times if it's forced upon you or it doesn't feel like the right thing, you're probably going to burn out and maybe not even doing it for the right reasons anyway. Yeah. You build, I think a lot of times you can build resentment, you know, and then you hear all the stories of, you know, parents taking advantage of the situation, taking all the money or doing uh, kids getting put up in, in situations that aren't good for them. You know, they're, yeah. they're the kid on history of the world who plays like the young Jesus. That kid was meant to act, man. Yeah. He's phenomenal couldn't miss a line was hilarious he's got his own uh cartoon show he voices on like the the kid is just like perfect so you see that and you're like yo that kid, that's why that kid's here you know for sure and it inspired me and i'm like this is this is incredible just to work with him you know and i'm excited to see where his career goes um but yeah no it's 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 a mix of all that stuff and and you know that's to, to your point about what you said about you know a feeling right i grew up in orange county for the most part even though i moved around a lot it's not very far away. It's an hour and a half drive, maybe, you know, on a fast day, no traffic, you can get there in 45 minutes to Newport, you know? And I tell people this all the time because they ask me where I'm from, from and they want to hear, you know, Norway or, you know, some other place across the planet or, yeah. or whatever. And, and I say, no, I'm not this far. But I knew I had to be in LA. It didn't matter how far I was. I could have been in Australia. I knew I had to be in LA. And that's what I did. And I, I mean, I slept on couches for five years, man. And uh, did the, did my due diligence until I finally got some feet under me, some confidence. I, I learned a little bit about business and, and how to show up and, and things started kind of happening. And now I'm here and, you know, I knew this is why. And I know I'm still supposed to be here yeah. for however much longer. But, you know, it's, 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 it's that feeling, you know. Absolutely, man. Have you ever yeah. done 23 Me? I did. Yeah. So uh, um, I did it years ago and I'm like 60 percent Irish, 20 some percent, 20 or 30 percent German. Uh, and then uh, just a mud of all kinds of other stuff. So it? not Scandinavian at all. No, I was no. expecting like a hundred percent Norwegian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm well, Norwegian got... and Danish. Oh, you are. Yeah. Dude. One of my best friends is Danish, uh, Morton. And, uh, we talk about that all the time. He's like, dude, you look more, you know, Danish or more Viking than I do. My and... mother's side is, is, so my father is, um, is like Ukrainian, um, uh, Polish, um, Georgian Jew. And my mother is uh, Danish and Norwegian, and wow. so and she looks like the like Heidi from the Hills, The Sound of Music, oh, really? like you know, yeah, she she it, it's they couldn't be more different. I always said like um, a uh, a kiss cam would never assume they were together. Hilarious. It would never be. They'd be like, nah, those two must just be friends, or they're sitting near each other. They look <laughs> yeah. like exact opposites. Wow. But yeah, but my whole all my family and my mom's side is Norwegian. Yeah, Danish. yeah. What I've learned over time, though, is that you know it's it was such a mix of stuff over there, so there might be some kind of lineage tied in, but there were. Maybe there's some Irish Vikings out there. I don't know, man. Yeah, for yeah, something, something there. And what are you doing? What are you up to now? Uh, just you know, working, uh, making films. You know, That's working awesome. on the auditioning process, doing all that stuff. But we've got a, a project right now that we shot in December in post, and we got to do a couple reshoots for that. And uh, writing a lot, man. I, I've fallen in love with writing, and I really want to get on the back end of it more. I want to do more producing, more directing, and stuff like that. So. Just moving forward with that. Congratulations, yeah. man. Yeah, man. Your film, you wrote this? Not this one. I, I was a producer on this last one, but uh, the the next couple, I, I've got three main ones that I really want to get out there and see if, see, how, see if it sticks, you know? Yeah, why not? Yeah. And that's taking control, especially with yeah. today. Like, you think about when you moved out, you know, getting to Hollywood or California or whatever was such a, not an impossible thing, but it was a, it's, it's now an easier idea in people's heads because yeah. we're all carrying movie cameras around with us at all times and to sort of be able to write and further that and to have that evolve as part of your stuff. I mean, to be a guy who's so specific and a great, I mean, you're such a great type for films. Like you could do histories clearly, you know, but you can do comedy and that's not, that's pretty hard. I mean, you don't see a lot of guys who can sort of play like leading sort of your energy, your style, your physique, and then have that yeah. sort of comedy background. So writing stuff from yourself, it's like, I really love Dave Bautista for that. Oh, he's incredible. I mean, there yeah. are there are great, and even Chris Hemsworth, we were saying like there, oh. you know, there are really great people. So to be, you know, I think that you're on your way and I definitely put you in that category. I appreciate that, man. That's that's always been a, a, the goal of mine, the dream too, is those are those leading male characters, you know, and, and grew up grew up with all the actions. You know, you got Arnold, you got Stallone, you got all these guys that are incredibly fit, even Brad Pitt, you know. Yeah. One of my favorite films is Troy. Absolutely. And he has this line in there, and this is why. It's it's because he says, I want what all men want. I just want it more. And I remember watching that and then seeing him, this physical, like, specimen, playing this incredible historical figure, man. And I was like, dude, I want to give that back one day. And, and so I fell in love with it. It gave me a confidence, you know, training, working out that I've never had before. And, and you know, I just, 
I don't know, man. That's just the stories I want to tell. Now you see people that, you know, they got CGI muscle on and, and muscle suits and stuff, which is great because it continues to evolve storytelling. But for me, I want to, there's this, uh, you know, practicalness in film that when you can keep that, it, it, it resonates more to me, you know? Well, they're also that the budget doesn't have to turn into that. Yeah. Like if they already find a guy, it makes it a lot cheaper on their end. Yeah, yeah. I love that the movie Troy, one of my favorite moments in that film is, because I think it's weird that people don't remember, or maybe they do, that he went from Fight Club to Achilles. Oh, yeah. So if the, and then when he talks about how much bigger the other guy is that he's going to have to fight, and then he goes, I've never seen a guy. And then the little kid goes, like, I would never fight that guy. And then Brad just goes, that's why no one will remember your name. Yeah. Hmm. And I was like, damn. Yeah. That is a, that is a <laughs> line, brother. And then to win that entire war off one swing of his sword, you know? Oh, dude. When he had Insane. Fought. And that's the thing. Guys like that, physical actors... Um, there are there are amazing parts, and guys like like uh, Brad have sort of paved the way for that. Like yeah. you look at Snatch or, or other things that he's done, where he's such a physical actor yeah. that now we we see that it can be done. And now the new generation, like we were just saying with Dave Batista, it's like that is going to be now more possible now more than ever. Those roles are being yeah. written because they prove that they work. Well, I think for a long time as well, and, and to, not to say we haven't had that the whole time, but for a long time it became more here. Yeah. You know, and so to, I've, and I, I've worked with so many different people and conversations I've had is like, it used to be more physical, you know, and now there's a, there's a mix of, there's so much content being made, there's so much incredible stuff out there and, and opportunity, but I've always enjoyed, just like with comedy, like I know I'm a, I'm a big guy and, you know, uh, I, I fill up a room pretty easily. I'm always in the way more than anything. But being physical, it changes the nature of how you act and, and brings yeah. the character more to life, I think, that I enjoy watching, but also doing, you know? You can get lost in a character, and, and that's when I feel like I, I love being able to see an incredible performance here, but when you have all of it, yeah, I, th I feel like it can elevate it to another level. And you know? we're obsessed with history now in the world. Yeah. You can think about the Vikings, like you were saying, there's all oh, these yeah. historical dramas and things. Even uh, Tom Hardy doing that show Taboo that was on FX that I yeah. hope comes back. And so somebody like you brings an authenticity to it and a, and a bigger hulking guy who can now, who has the experience, who has the resume, who has the chops to make someone like that one of the leads now yeah. that we haven't seen. So that's, I mean, there's, a, dude, I, I, I see bright things in your future. I appreciate that, man. Uh, I, I know either way, um, I'm not going to stop pushing forward, working as hard as I can, and just keep my head down because I, I believed in this since I was a little kid. I've always wanted it, and for so long it seemed like an impossible dream yeah. until I decided to commit to it and say, whatever happens, happens, but I'm not going to quit. You're not going to let me – or it's the reason it's not going to work is not because I'm not putting in 100% of my effort all the time to go make this happen. I love it, dude. Yeah. Where can people find you? Uh, just on social media. Uh, my My – Instagram's Brock O'Hearn, you know? Yeah, uh, we'll tag you in everything. Yeah, that's it, man. Yeah, yeah. Dude, thank you so much for being our first guest. So Dude, great to have you here. It's awesome, honor. man. Yeah, you guys have a sick studio. I'm looking forward to listening to more of the podcast. Thanks, man. Uh, your stuff's awesome, dude. Yeah, we have a lot of mutual friends. Really cool. Yeah. Paul's all right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> By the way, not a friend. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> um, we know some people, the same people, and we have mutual friends. Yeah, um, yeah, well, dude, thank you so much for being our first guest. Love yeah. having you, and uh, congratulations on all the well-deserved success. I Appreciate know it's just it, the beginning. Yeah, well, I hope we get to work together sometime. I do, too. Yeah, man. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys.